Triad Mastery Bootcamp. So I'm just going to hang and uh, work on some ideas. There is a PDF if you need some help. We're just going to be looking at uh, a basic major triad, but we're going to run it through some obstacle courses. Uh, today I was thinking I would do leading tones, circle of fifths, okay, movement, trying to get ideas happening around the fretboard and our fingers moving, and just a little bit more mastery of our fundamentals. So, uh, welcome. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section. Facebook doesn't always show them to me in real time, so if I don't see them or respond, it might be because I just don't see it. Let's start with C major. Again, if you need the PDF, you can grab it at the link. Let's just first run through the basic three positions that I personally like to practice when I'm sitting and warming up and getting things happening. Um, yes, there are more than three positions, but I really like these three. I kind of whittled it all down to these three when I was having to relearn to play due to my medical issues uh, because there is no overlap. So that means that there are kind of some positions that are somewhat missing, but they're not really missing. They're just sort of bridge positions. So there's a position here, a position here, a position here. There are notes in the middle, but none of them are actually missing. They're all contained within these three. There's no overlapping here. So the first one starts on the third fret G note. Okay. The next one's the eighth fret, sort of root position triad, starting on the C note. And then the last one is the twelfth fret, E note, kind of first inversion. Between these three, we have all of our C major triad notes covered from this low G to this high G. What is that? Uh, two, three octaves. Um, there's no, there are no pitches missing. We're covered. So here's the obstacle course I want to do with these today. Um, I think we kind of hinted at this one last week. I can't remember now. We mainly did chromaticism last week, but I think I mentioned this, which is why it was on my mind. We're gonna play the leapfrog game. So I'm gonna play the first note. I'm gonna leap up over this next one, straight to here. So I'm gonna go from G up to E. I'm not gonna play G, C, E. I'm gonna play G up to E. Uh, but instead of going right to E, I'm gonna to go to the leading tone just beneath it. And then I'm gonna come up to it. So I'm gonna play G, D sharp, E. Obviously that D sharp is not in the triad, but it's a leading tone that can take us up to E. And then I'm just going to continue that pattern all the way through this position. Okay, G, D sharp, E, then I'm going to come back down to C, and I'm going to play F sharp, G, right? Because after C, if we skip the next note, which is E, we land on G. started. Okay, that's the whole position ascending. Um, I would not think of this as Lydian. I mean, you certainly could. Right, there appears to be a sharp 11 there, and it could sort of be a sharp 11. It's just a leading tone. It's just a melodic tension note that's meant to make us feel a little bit off-center and pull us back into the triad. Just like this is not, in my mind, a sharp nine, this D sharp. Could it be? Yes, it could be, but it doesn't matter. Like, we could play this over a basic C6 chord, just a run-of-the-mill major one tonic. The 
idea is that the primary anchor notes here are just the basic triad, and then everything else is just a leading tone that's meant to create a little bit of tension and friction that pulls the line forward back into the triad. Um, get back in tune. So then we're going to descend. Okay, it's the exact opposite. So we're going to start at the top note. We're going to leapfrog over this note. We're going to jump all the way down to here, but we're going to actually over jump it. We're going to jump beyond the note we want all the way down underneath it to its leading tone and then come back up to it. So if we start on C, you would expect the next note to be E, but it's not. It's D sharp. Take this, I got my Drum Genius app open. Let's take this and um, let's just move this position through the circle fits. Okay. David, what's up, man? Uh, I hope the office is closed for a good reason but it's cool to have you live with us on here. Um, so, okay, that's kind of the vibe we're going for. If you need to go slower, that's cool. Go slower, maybe turn my volume down and set your metronome where you need it to be. Um, but, I just, I haven't warmed up yet today, so I just want to get my fingers moving. Uh, I'm going to try and just take this through the circle of fifths with no stopping. We'll see if it happens. One, two, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four. 
C. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to do, I think, yeah, we still got plenty of time. Gonna check in and see if anybody's got any questions here. Facebook's super annoying. You have to like reload the page every time you want to see comments. I don't know why they don't just show them in real time. Um, so this is really bad voice leading. So this is good for learning one position at a time. So if you're totally brand new at triads, uh, I would do, I would recommend what I have been doing the last couple years since needing to relearn to play again, which is just to take one position and force myself through the circle fist. There was a couple of weak ones, right? You would think that it would be as easy in every key as it is in C major, because it's all the same shape, but it's not the same. Like I noticed I messed up in A flat. I made like a little mental uh, asterisk in my mind when I hit A flat, I got a little bit off. Um, I think it was D major. I also got off somewhere just descending one and I think it was because I was thinking about something else that I wasn't in the flow. I was like thinking about what I was going to talk about next. Um, but just make little notes to yourself. If you're, if you're have a rough spot in certain keys, make sure you hit those first the next time you practice or stop everything and just practice those keys. Okay, we always want to go to our weakest place. Most musicians, in my teaching experience, most musicians don't want to go to their weak places because those are the frustrating spots and the boring spots and they're challenging. Instead, they would rather spend time playing with the stuff they already know, which is great. We want to have time where we just play and have fun and enjoy the things we know. But if we want to improve, if you want to break the cycle and not feel like you're just, you know, spinning your wheels for 10 years, 20 years and not seeing improvement, you have to do things differently. You have to go to the stuff you're weak at and clean it up. Go slow, keep it simple, one thing at a time, and you'll start to see progress. So what I want to do next is to uh, do the exact same thing, but I'm going to bring all three positions together. So I'm not going to jump from that C to this F. I'm going to jump to this F. Uh, why? Because it's way closer. So the goal here is to try and move slowly up the fretboard, one key at a time, still moving through the circle of fifths. No big leaps, no big jumps. We're looking for smooth movement up the fretboard, okay? Um, we'll do this nice and slow together, because in order to do this, you gotta be comfortable with all three positions. So if you're not comfortable, we're just gonna go slow. Starting on C again. position that I started in, the same sort of inversion of this triad skeleton structure, uh, but now it's right here. Again, we're 
we're already in position here. Literally, the, the note we landed on for D flat is now the note we're starting on for G flat F sharp. Okay, B major, we gotta move up just a touch. So, um, again, that's a little asterisk in my mind that I'm going to have to go back and make sure I'm using the best fingers uh, for the next note. Like, I was, I'm always trying to think one or two notes ahead um, and find the right fingers so that I never find myself kind of, like, tripping over, like, when I'm trying to get to a note. In real time, when I'm performing, I don't care. Like, I'll do whatever I have to do. You have to be like a Navy SEAL. Like if you land on a certain note with a certain finger and you need to get to another note with a weird finger, then you just jump, right? Like it doesn't matter what happens, but in the practice room, you wanna go slow and you wanna try and find the most perfect options you can and repeat them over and over. Practice does not make perfect, okay? Anyone who told you that is either purposely lying to you or just doesn't know what they're talking about. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. It's very different. If you practice something terribly and incorrectly over and over and over, you're not going to get perfect. You're going to get worse. You're going to become more permanent at doing it in a bad, incorrect way that will hold you back. And then you have to unlearn that muscle memory, which is not a fun experience. Um, so go slow when you're doing this type of work. When it's like this like boot camp mastery type work, take your time. Make sure you're finding like the most perfect, logical, rational way to use your fingers. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're going to make it harder to speed up. Right now, I'm going very slow. I'm stopping to talk to you guys. Um, this is the time that you want to think about. I, I like to think about like, a, like an NFL field goal kicker. They'll videotape that person on the practice field, not during a game. Well, maybe during a game also, but just during practice, they'll videotape him kicking a field goal and they will slow it down and look at it like frame by frame by frame by frame, looking at every angle, you know, how the heel is sitting, when the ball of the, of the foot kind of, you know, hits the ground, how they're turning, and they'll analyze the entire movement frame by frame so that they can work on those tiny little microcosmic details because that will allow the field goal kicker to alter their technique ever so slightly to become a better player. So that's what we want to do when we're practicing this way. We want to be hypercritical, okay? So that we have more muscle memory for us, better muscle memory when we're performing. I think I left off on B flat. That's like kind of a weird movement. I have to jump my hand back and I, I don't like that I need to do that. Instead, I'm gonna try to use using my middle finger here. That way this, uh, this pointer finger is ready to go. It's like in position already. Let's try that again. doing this back and forth several times again when I'm improvising I don't care I'll do I'll jump around as much as I need to when I'm improvising but when I'm trying to just build muscle memory this is the time to look at these tiny little details this is the stuff I used to do my classical teacher in college used to make me do all the time we would look at a piece of music and we would think about it like a riddle like a puzzle like find the perfect finger order for every note so that you never have a note where your fingers don't feel right and sometimes that meant you'd get all the way to the end of a line and be like, oh shoot, there's no way to get to that note perfectly. I need to go back. I need to erase all my pencil markings and go back and find a different finger order to get to this note better. Okay. Once I get this finger order, which I like now, I'm going to do that on repeat a bunch of times over and over and over because practice makes permanent. That's the only way to do it. You just have to tell your, your fingers over and over and over, this is what I want, this is what I want. 
the fingers can remember things. Muscle memory will learn stuff, but you can't just, it's not like a human being. You can't just speak to it and say, this is what I want. They're, they're like puppies, right? You have to be consistent and disciplined and train them over and over and over and over. And eventually they will understand what it is you want from them through repetition. But that only happens if it's the same thing every time. starting to figure out the game now. They're starting to remember that I want my middle finger on this finger so that my index finger is set up and ready to go for that so that I don't have to jump back and then slide up again. Can you guys see my hand? I don't know if you can see it the way I can, but it's much less movement. I'm kind of over exaggerating it now so you can see my whole arm moving. It's like jumping back, sliding up versus almost no movement. Okay, back down. So here's the opposite problem. Descending, when I come from here, if I land on my index finger here, it's creating a problem for me there. This note, if I play with my index finger, is an issue. I would rather, I would rather play this note with my middle finger so that my index finger is in position and ready to go for this note. In order to use my middle finger for the 10th fret, it means that I can't use it for the 11th fret just before it on the second string. This note. Because then I have to jump there. Right, you see how the whole thing is like one big puzzle? So what do I have to do? I have to change my middle finger here so that I can use it here. I need a different finger to set me up here. So I'm just gonna use my ring finger. Right, that sets me up for my 10th fret middle finger, which sets me up for this note. Okay, so not only uh, will I do what I was talking about a minute ago where I'll find a problem and I'll go straight for the problem and figure out a better solution and then do it on repeat. I will also almost always break it down into a smaller bit. So I'm not going to practice the whole position. I'm certainly not going to practice ascending and descending, but I'm not even going to do the whole thing descending. I'm just going to do like this little tiny chunk because that's where the problem is. So I'm just going to do that on repeat to save, you know, half as much time to spend half as much time as I would have spent if I descended the whole position. Because right now my only concern is cleaning this part up. If there's a problem in the lower half, I'll deal with that when I get to it. Okay. This is just teaching my puppies how to sit and how to roll over and how to grab a beer out of the fridge for me. into the little mini chunk here. So that I get that movement, I like that movement. So notice I'm, I'm not jumping straight from the little chunk to the entire position, I'm building it back up kind of a couple notes additional at a time. the trick and they forget what we're doing. That's why we just have to be consistent and disciplined. There it is, my 
fingers remembered I had to slow it down, but they got it. behind but I'll tell you this right now I'm only doing this for the sake of time once this class is over I'm gonna come back to this shape because my puppies need more training and probably tomorrow during my shed time I'll warm up with this and I'll do it for the next couple days because the better we want to be the more time we need to spend on our weaknesses right I know where these notes are like this this position I could play this half asleep with my eyes closed this position but being able to get all these um, these ob <clears throat> these obstacle courses at that same level of comfort, where my fingers just kind of always know how to wiggle through them, is just going to make my improvisational playing that much better, that much cleaner. B flat next is E flat. <laughs> position, that other position we were just playing. Let me do this one again. Here's E flat. There it is. E flat. Here's A flat. Okay. Here is um, D flat. We got to do a little bit of a jump with this one, just a couple of frets up. We're back to this same position I was working on a minute ago. Right? My finger remembered to do what I wanted from it. And descending again. D flat, here's G flat. This way, I'm gonna drop it down an octave. Same exact position, but I just feel like staying down here today. Again, my puppy remembered what I wanted. Again. A. Uh, where's the leading tone? Um, to the process of muscle memory building in a relatively challenging-ish environment, like not crazy fast speeds, um, but we're not just sitting inside of one position and just doing the same thing over and over. We might need to, right? By moving through the circle of fits, we're forcing ourselves to look at every position, every inversion, um, or I should say every key using all of our inversions. We're not necessarily hitting every inversion within each key but we're forcing ourselves to move around the fretboard, hit every major triad, major key, um, using three different inversions, and that will show us weak spots, weak 
keys, weak areas of the fretboard, uh, weak muscle memory, and then we have to go in and we have to fill in the holes. Okay. Um, this was, was, and honestly still is a lot of the foundation building work that I started doing when I needed to relearn to play. Um, because to me, if I can see this, like this is directly applicable to playing over standards. Whether or not you can see that yet, that's cool. Keep hanging with our live classes. Um, check out our courses if you want to, but you know, I'm going to do my best to continue guys, continue showing you guys a lot of just like little snippets of how I like to think, but this could be D minor. around a C major triad, which I can then ornament with leading tones. I can We can add diatonic passing notes, like scale tones. We can add a lot of stuff, but this is sort of the skeleton that it's all built with inside of, um, which is very helpful for me to be able to see the whole fretboard based on this type of structure for melodic playing, because it shows me where my strongest diatonic anchor notes are. Everything else is secondary to these three notes for the way I like to think and hear and play. All right, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I want to check in on you guys and see if there were any questions I can hit before I got to go. Um, Michael, you're welcome, and thanks for hanging, man. I appreciate that. Daniel, thank you. Uh, David, do you advise sliding or picking that half step in the pattern? Um, either, both, neither, right? You could hammer on, you could slide, you could pick them both. You could, um, you know, for, it, it kind of depends on where you are, where each individual person is with their playing and what your long-term vision is for your music. If you're beginner or early intermediate, I would say don't really worry about legato playing, like just pick everything because you can... Remember what I was saying before, like your puppies, these are like puppies, right? So we can't ask puppies to learn to sit and roll over at the same time. They can only learn one trick at a time. That's just the nature of puppies. So if you're still working on your, uh, on your triad shape, you shouldn't even be doing leading tones to begin with, right? Just practice your basic triad position. If you can do that, then you can try it with the leapfrog game. If you can do that, then you can add the leading tones in. So there's like three different tricks at work just to play. Right? There's a position, there's a leapfrog game, and there's a leading tone. So I would personally recommend, depending on where a musician is, work on each one of those, you know, add one thing in at a time. You might need to start just with the position, then you can add the, um, the leapfrog, then you can add the leading tones. And those are three different tricks. Much easier to learn one trick than it is to learn three at the same time. Even if you learn one trick, then another, then another, you will learn that in three separate practice sessions quicker than trying to learn it all at the same time. So that's my first piece of advice. The next thing that you're talking about is getting a legato feel with slides or hammer-ons, uh, not picking certain notes. That's another trick. Right? That's just another layer of complexity built on top of this very stupidly simple. Right, that was all, I think I'd use, did I do all slides? 
I wasn't paying attention. I know that I didn't pick the resolved note, any, any of them. I did all some kind of legato. So here's slide, slide, slide. That was a hammer on. Slide, slide. Again, just like I was doing before with picking the correct fingers to get me through it properly, you might want to pick one technique at a time and see if you can make it happen, like just practice the slide. Or just practice the hammer-on. You might need to jump around a little bit more because now we need another finger ready to go. We can't just hit a note and move it. We have to like be prepared with two fingers. So like I can't use my pinky for this note. Feels awkward because then it's a ring finger pinky hammer on, which is possible but weak. That's probably my best bet at this point. <laughs> See, that's weird. Like, I'm on my ring finger, so I'm gonna have to jump. Okay, uh, so. Explore, experiment, see what feels right for you. Your, the tendons and muscles and joints in your hand are constructed differently than anyone else's, right? They're not the same as mine. They're not the same as anybody's. So there's not going to be a book that's going to say this is the best way to do it because it's not going to be true for everybody. It, will, it might be the best way for the person who wrote that book, but that might be because they have a longer pinky finger than you do. Like, I don't know, like it just everybody's different. Plus we all have a different state of muscle memory that's already present in our fingers. So you've been playing for a long time. I know you have David and your muscle memory, all the stuff you've played throughout your life, the habits you have are gonna dictate to you what feels more comfortable for you that might not work for me, it might not be comfortable. So it's just one of those things you just have to explore, set five minutes aside to just Think about the mechanics of the hand and to really like don't judge anything just explore experiment and just ask yourself what feels good right um, and then of course what sounds good if it doesn't sound good that's more important than if it doesn't feel good we can train our muscles to do new things and it will eventually feel okay but if we can find a way to do it in the framework of what's already comfortable it will be quicker um, it says there's 11 comments, I'm only, but it's only showing me four, so hopefully there's no other big questions. If there is, you guys can always hit me up um, in a message, or I'll try and get to them uh, when I wrap up and, I, and Facebook shows me the rest of these. Uh, Paul, you're welcome. Great to see you on here, man. Sean, uh, great stuff. Warm up, never get tired of the boot camp. Yeah, I mean, boot camp for life, man. Just like you know, build that foundation and then over time there's going to be cracks in the foundation and we're going to have to come back and fill them back in. It's, it's a, you know, it's a lifelong thing, but we can learn to find enjoyment in it and the stronger the foundation gets, the more fun we can have when we're playing, which for me just makes me enjoy coming back to the really boring, rote, trivial stuff because I know that it'll get stronger and that my playing will become better from it. Uh, I gotta run. Thanks for hanging today, everybody. I'll see you again soon. Happy practice.